the truth be told, uh, whenever a combined meeting comes around, there's usually a, a sudden look of surprise in everybody's faces, and then a d desperate scrabble around to see who's got something to talk about. So at the outset, let me apologize for dishing up SASOG leftovers, but this was one of the talks that I, that I gave at SASOG. The second thing I should say is because it's an ethics talk, of course I could ask you questions instead, and then you could be on the film as well as me, and then we'd all be quits. But uh, we'll see. Maybe I won't do that. So the subject that I, that I thought was worth talking about, and it seems to be something that's almost been done to death by so many different people in so many different ways, is this whole issue of cesarean section rates. Um, and what I really wanted to do was to um, examine it from the point of view of uh, by ethical consideration. But there are different reasons why you might think that this is an issue, and you might think of it uh, as an issue because there's an increased risk of mortality. You may think of it as an issue because of cost, and then there are the bioethical considerations, which is where I intend to get to. But before I do that, uh, perhaps just to begin by unpacking a little bit about this question of mortality. And again, um, there's a reference here. It's not going to come as a surprise to anybody sitting in this audience here that if you do a cesarean section as compared to a vaginal, a normal vaginal delivery, there is a statistically significant increase in the risk of death, ICU admission, transfusion, and hysterectomy, which varies according to the nature of the procedure, whether it's elective or emergency. So that is t beyond any form of dispute. So there is um, a case fatality rate associated with cesarean delivery, and it runs somewhere between 0.7 and 1.6 per thousand cesarean deliveries. And those are useful figures to remember as well, because when you come around to counseling patients, perhaps that's some of the things that you need to be disclosing to the patient. Now, this speaks, of course, to the individual risk, that if you do a, um, a particular, a given cesarean section on a given patient, these are the risks in general. But that risk compounds over time, because once you've had the cesarean section, in the subsequent pregnancy, there's going to be additional risks as well and you can work them out, uterine rupture, morbidly adherent placenta previa is more common, and you may have trauma if you're going to go and do a repeat cesarean section um, because of previous, previous adhesions and difficult surgery. So the risks for an index cesarean section are as they're stated, and then they get worse with any subsequent cesarean section. Now, that doesn't mean to say that doing a cesarean section is, is without its benefits, because quite clearly there are benefits. And here are some data which shows uh, if we look at the risk of maternal mortality in relation to cesarean delivery rates, this is the graph that you, will, uh, that you can refer to showing what happens. And there's a point of inflection at about a 20% cesarean section rate where there's no further benefit in terms of reducing the risk of maternal mortality if you increase your cesarean delivery rate beyond that. And the same sort of graph applies to uh, neonatal mortality rates that doing a certain number of cesarean sections is going to save a certain number of babies' lives. And once again, the point of inflection is somewhere around about 20%. Once you go above that, there's no further indication that you're going to procure any benefit in terms of the outcome. Now, this sort of data has spurred the WHO on to make a statement about uh, cesarean section rates in 2015. And they say that cesarean, section rates, uh, cesarean sections are effective in saving maternal and infant lives, but only when they're required for medically indicated reasons. At a population level, cesarean section rates higher than 10% are not associated, associated with reductions in maternal and new, newborn mortality rates. So it's a bit of a strange statement because you look at the data and you think, well, it's not 10%, it's actually 20%. But I want to put it to you that quite apart from haggling where the cutoff point is, the argument in itself is incorrect. And it appears to be true at a certain level, but if you examine it more closely, it's not true. Because mortality is a completely inadequate criterion for adjudicating whether a cesarean section is justified or not. Uh, for example, one can think about the question of the cesarean section rates that are driven up by CTG monitoring. And there are many, many cesarean sections that are done um, which are justified not simply on the basis of the fact that you have delivered a baby that's alive, but a baby that's alive and non-acidotic. So it's not enough to think of a concept of being dead or alive as an adequate outcome variable in obstetric practice. There's also this question of risk and the quality of life um, that accrues as a result of this intervention. So... Um, 
What we can safely conclude, therefore, as far as mortality rates is concerned, is that there's quite definitely an increased risk uh, than compared to vaginal delivery. There's also more morbidity. There is measurable and demonstrable benefit in terms of mortality rates, but the actual desirable rate is quite difficult to estimate. But it's also quite clear that cesarean delivery is associated with a procedural risk of mortality, and those figures, as I cited them to you, of up to 1.6 per thousand case fatality rate. Now, to these sort of considerations, you also need to add a contextual risk uh, because these are very general figures. And, you know, even in this province, if you look at the risk of a cesarean delivery, where it's conducted, if it happens to be conducted at a district hospital in the metro area where there may be less experienced medical officers practicing, the risk is going to be greater than if it's conducted at Tigerberg Hospital where there's an experienced registrar um, performing that cesarean section. And when we talk of risk also, we need to be mindful of the fact that whose risk are we talking about the whole time? We're talking about the mother's risk. Are we talking about the baby? There's a possibility of maternal fetal conflict of interest here, and there is a situational variation in the risk-benefit ratio. And all of this translates into the fact that it's very difficult to justify a one-size-fits-all approach. There has to be some individual appreciation of risk, and there has to be an exercise of judgment in each and every individual case that accounts for the particular risk in that circumstance. So that's the question of um, mortality and morbidity. Would we be concerned about cesarean section rates because of cost? And quite clearly the answer is yes. I'm told that in the private sector, if you have a cesarean section rate, uh, a cesarean section, the, the cost, when you add everything up, the surgeon, the assistant, the anesthetist, the pediatrician, the hospital, everything, it's coming to about 42,000 rand for, for the actual delivery. Compared to a vaginal delivery, which is um, cheaper, it's 30,000. And the public sector, if you go and look up the, uh, what is cited as the fee that would be charged to somebody who could afford to pay um, for a cesarean section, um, it's somewhere around about 22,000, and for a vaginal delivery, 12,000. So there is a cost differential. There's no doubt about that. And for us in the public sector, certainly we, uh, quite aside from that, we just simply do not have the resources to have a limitless number of cesarean sections. We don't have enough beds. We do not have enough doctors. We can't accommodate a higher cesarean section rate. Now, what happens in the private sector? Well, here's a report. Figures released by the South African Council for Medical Schemes showed that nearly 70% of births to women covered by the private medical scheme were by a caesarean section in this country last year. 70% caesarean section rate. Now, is that a problem? Well, cost containment is certainly a legitimate concern in the public health sector. And this is all to do with the things that you would understand intuitively, that there's a utilitarian process of reasoning which says that one has to use the resources that one has available to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people, and we need to work out what that calculus is. But one thing is for sure is that there's not enough money to have unjustified expenditure on anything. Now, along the way, we also need to recognize that there is a problem related to statistical norms, which are then applied to general rates, because the focus of public medicine and, and public enterprise is the general good whereas the focus of medical care is the good of individuals in both the public and the private sector. So this, there, there is this sort of dissonance between what might be generally desirable for the public at large and what might need to be done for individuals. So, again, in the midst of all this type of reasoning, we need to recognize the fact that any form of simplistic reasoning, in fact, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to focus on rates only. And what we should be better doing is focusing on the adequacy of the justification for individual caesarean deliveries. So the cost where it is incurred must be justified according to some form of reasonable criterion. So there are the cost issues, there's the mortality issue, and then what I really need to address now, which is the question of the ethical precepts. And I, I'm going to deal with this only just very simply from the point of view of a principalist ethical reasoning. And you'll all be familiar with the, the principles that, that, are usually, um, that are usually invoked as far as principalist reasoning is concerned. 
and they have to do with the intersection of a priori duties that you hold, um, the so-called prima facie principles of allowing patients to exercise their autonomy in all sorts of circumstances, acting beneficently in the interest of the patient, preventing them from coming to any form of harm, and paying some attention to aspects of social justice. And I want to just flesh these out a little bit. In the first case, um, autonomy is important, and it's important because, as Immanuel Kant pointed out, human beings have a dignity which is beyond all price. It's not something that we could ever trade away, and it exists because we are quite unique amongst all creatures on this planet in the sense that we are sentient, we are self-aware, we know what we're doing, we have a capacity for reason, and because of those things, and because we can act out of a sense of goodwill towards one another, we also have the capacity to make moral choices and act out of a sense of free will. And that is completely unique. And that is what gives human beings this quality of dignity, which, as he put it, lay beyond all price. And his um, deontological reasoning, secular deontological reasoning, came down to one rule and one rule only, and that was called the categorical imperative. Things, this principle that you had to respect in all circumstances. And there are different iterations of this particular categorical imperative, but the second one that I want to point to you is that you always needed to treat other people as an end in themselves and never merely as the means to an end. So you need to respect their autonomy in every circumstance. Now, to say that we're all imbued with a sense of autonomy doesn't mean to say that we can act completely without restraint, not in general nor in, in, in the circumstance of medical practice. So um, although it may be my autonomous desire to go around here insulting people who support the Stormers, uh, uh, I can't do that. I shouldn't do that. It might have dire consequences for me apart from anything else. And the same thing would apply in, in circumstances of medical practice. We all lead, therefore, a social life. We have a social existence. And our interests that we would wish to pursue are always going to be limited by the rights of other people, and we have to recognize that. And the same would apply to the practice of medicine, that the things that we desire may not be made available to us because other people have interests which lay claim to resources which are therefore not available to us. The question of how we give expression to autonomy, though, in medicine is that we pursue the process of informed consent. So where there are choices to be made, we wish the patient to have the right to make an autonomous decision to make a choice between available alternatives based upon sound knowledge and without being coerced in any way by anybody. And in doing this, the medical practitioner is allowing individuals to appreciate the uniqueness of their own circumstance, their own existence, and gives honor to the, to, to the very human dignity that they possess. But a choice, to begin with, has to exist. In order to exercise your autonomous right to do something, there needs to be some options available. And that brings us down to this question of Caesarean section on request, or if you like, Caesar for softer indications. Is this something which we need to put out there as a choice for the patients? Uh, does it fall within the ambit of this categorical imperative that we shouldn't be using people as a means to a particular end, saving money? Should it be something that, that, that is inherently a choice that they can exercise or not. And can it then be argued that vaginal delivery versus cesarean section is inevitably a choice for all women? And if that is indeed the case, what are your obligations as a practitioner in terms of beneficence and non-maleficence and justice? Uh, because you have certain knowledge in relation to how dangerous cesarean section is and the harm that may accrue from it. Is that overridden by this desire, if you like, to give respect to autonomy. Now, the answer to that is no. Autonomy actually has no hegemony in the ranking of these principles at all. Uh, not only that, but what others choose to do is an extension of their free will, uh, free will limited by the interests of other people. And you can even get to the point where saying where others choose to act harmfully, they may continue to do so. But any moral agent, being you as a practitioner, for example, 
you're not obliged to become complicit in their harmful actions on the basis of respecting their autonomy. So a Kantian would, would have it that anybody who wants to do something as an expression of their autonomous free will should be allowed to do it, even if it has morally harmful consequences. But each individual is not required to, in the process of respecting that other person who's going to do something harmful, they're not required to become complicit in their actions. And this is the reasoning that goes behind, for example, the abortion law, that uh, if you have moral objections to procured abortion, you have the right to say that I do not agree with this, I do not need to become complicit in the expression of this person's autonomy, who within the context of the South African law is coming in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy saying, I don't want this pregnancy because I don't want it. I want to have an abortion. You have the right to say, no, I'm not going to do this for you. I'll provide care for you. I'll pass you on to the next practitioner who doesn't perhaps share my, my moral views. And you are allowed to take that step back and say, no, this is not right. I do not see that it is right. And I'm not going to agree with you. So where does it leave you? Because there's this question of autonomy, there's a question of beneficence and non-maleficence. You have a duty as a practitioner to act in the interests of your patient and to avoid the possibility of harm. And you ought to know that there can be no recourse, therefore, to caesarean section without a reason that can be fully justified on the basis of available data. And the reasons that you choose to justify this, the caesarean section need to be credible. Now, what about the issue of justice? Because we've gone through this question of autonomy and how important that is, the fact that you do not need to um, respect the autonomy of the individual if it leads to harmful consequences, your obligation to be beneficent and non-maleficent. But what about justice? Where does this come into it? And social justice requires that everybody within the country in which we live has equitable access to basic services. And that is seen to be an obligation of the state. And it's not difficult to discern in making that statement that there's a vast array, array uh, of possibilities of things that need to be funded by the state. So health is only one thing. There's social welfare, there's education, there's housing, there's security, and many other things. And it's quite clear, as all of us know, the resources are limited, and we actually have to make choices. And that's fine. We can understand that in the context of the state. But what about the private sector? Because in the private sector, seemingly there is no such constraints. There's more money available there. Uh, it's fine. People can surely buy what they want. And surely the same sort of considerations do not apply there. So there's this, there's this dissonance between the freedom to buy what you want and get what you want versus communitarian restraint, constraint, if you work in the public sector where you need to divvy up what you have in the best interests of everybody. And it's true to say that if the broader interests, the broader needs of society are met, then the requirements of living within a free state, the requirements of liberty, should be that what can be afforded by individuals should be regarded as permissible. But that must bring us to a consideration of where are we in this country? Where are we in terms of doing what we ought to be doing? And here's a publication from uh, Bongani Moyosi, who's the incoming dean at UCT, and Solly Beneter, who was the uh, um, head of the bioethics unit, now retired. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think about a year ago. Health and healthcare in South Africa 20 years after Mandela. And just on the second paragraph there, approximately 16% of South Africans have private health insurance that provides access to health care from the remaining 70% of doctors who work full-time in the private sector. So 70% of the qualified doctors are looking after 16% of the people in this country. 84% of them are looked after by the 30% of doctors who are in full-time state service. Many of the state hospitals are in a state of crisis with much of the public health care infrastructure run down and dysfunctional as a result of underfunding, mismanagement, and neglect. So the reality is that in this country, there's a national shortage of nursing staff. There are too few beds in the public sector, 
and that there are unacceptably high rates, as you well know, of premature and avoidable mortality among the general population. Here, from that same publication, is a ranking of South Africa together with other lower middle income countries, and they're not great places, Costa Rica, Jamaica, Brazil, Romania, Iran, Kazakhstan, in respect of life expectancy at birth in 1990 and 2010. South Africa ranked 7 in 1990, 2010 it ranked 7 still. Age standardized death rate, where did we rank? 7 in 1990, where do we rank in 2010? Number 7. Age standardized rate of years lived with disability, in 1990 we ranked number 6, where we in, in 2010? We ranked 7. And here is life expectancy again um, uh, for females in a range of different countries. This doesn't come from that same article. And the African countries are the ones that are down here in gray, including Namibia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Swaziland, Nigeria, and then Asia and the um, so-called developed industrialized countries, European Union, United States, are up there. So what is it that we are looking at here? Then we're looking at a private sector and we're looking at a public sector where there are radically different perspectives on life and resources. And I would put it to you that there is a very dangerous disconnect between the public and the private healthcare systems in this country. And they behave as though they belong to separate communities rather than as being citizens of the same country, the same community. And our moral obligation in all this is to secure basic services for all. And thereafter, we can give attention to fulfilling individual desires for particular kinds of treatment to the extent that society can sustain such initiatives. And the reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you allow your cesarean section rate to go up and up and up, it's going to need more beds and it's going to need more nurses. And I don't think this country can afford to continue to establish private hospitals, which then result in an egress of qualified staff from public institutions into the private sector, whilst the basic needs of the community in this country remain unmet as they have been demonstrably shown to be unmet by Mayosi and Benita. And it is as a matter of social justice that I would argue that at this particular point in the history of this country, caesarean section on demand is not a defendable position, proposition uh, for South Africa. So... The caesarean section on demand, therefore, is a useful example because it brings to light all the relevant considerations. On the one hand, the question of the patient and what the patient wants, the desire to have her autonomy, autonomous wishes met and, and serviced. On the other hand, you as the practitioner is going to be sitting there thinking about how do I respect this individual's autonomy, what are my obligations in terms of acting beneficently and with non-maleficence towards this patient, and then the third triangle, the third loop there, is the question of society. And what, what is society's stake in all this? What about this issue of distributive justice? So in conclusion, I think some things are clear, others are not. What is clear is that cesarean delivery will and uh, always require justification, no matter where you are, whether you're in South Africa or elsewhere, you're going to have to justify what you're doing because of the possibility of harm accruing to, to the mother. Caesarean section rates have varied over time and will continue to do so, uh, but quite clearly not everyone can or should be delivered by a caesarean section. There are very large discrepancies between caesarean section rates in the public and the private sectors in South Africa, and there is no ethical obligation, as far as I can see, to provide a particular service on demand. What is not clear is what an appropriate rate is for caesarean delivery. And it's also not clear to me how practitioners who are providing services in the marketplace can free themselves from perverse incentives, the pressure that gets applied to them to do what the patient wants because otherwise they're going to go to practitioner B who will do what they want. So my last word in this is that there's no finality of thought in this subject. It is controversial. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to put certain arguments on the table. And if there is some better argument which counters what I've had to say, I'm here to listen to it and to take issue with it if necessary. So please, the floor is open now. 
It's yours. You can argue with me if you like. Thank you. Um, it's uh, not... It's not a question, it's a comment. Um, I, I really endorse what you've said this afternoon. However, I, I have a grave concern about the Caesarean section debate. Um, I was at a meeting in London, the Figo Safe Motherhood meeting, where these very same issues were discussed. WHO are also concerned about these issues. However, I have not come across any... Uh, sort of body of, of society or whatever pre representing people that are concerned about women across the globe that require a cesarean section that do not have one. And I think we need to put that debate on the, on the table because um, there's quite a number of countries and, and I think a, quite a proportion of women that when they go in labor, there is no prospect of them having a cesarean section. Either it's not available, or the hospital is dysfunctional, or they cannot pay. Um, even to, the, to today, in a country like Pakistan, if you can't pay, you can't have. And it's just, sorry. So I, I, I feel, and I, I put an action in the process of seeing whether we can actually reach that goal, that that we should have a United Nations human's right, it should have been included in the human rights of the United Nations, that if a woman needs a cesarean section, she should have one. Because by that, by doing that, making it a human right, we can put pressure on countries to make the services available to comply with human rights. Um, so I think the, the whole argument also has another side, and, and I think if we, if we really see the consequences of that side, you only have to go to a country like Ethiopia to see how many women have fistulas, and, and, and th that's the only way by which you can address that problem is actually making the services available that these women should have. I think in South Africa to a lesser degree, but I think there are cir circumstances where women actually require a cesarean section and due to, delay due to delays end up with problems because um, there was just such a long queue. And, and I think those are things that really concern me. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to the, this question of, of social justice as an issue in, in any given community, that there needs to be a commitment to that. And, and, you know, I think people so often point to the, the problems in this country, but I think this country has, has walked a very considerable distance in terms of realizing its obligations to people, one to another, in terms of the citizenry of this country, that there's a, a, a heavy commitment to looking after one another in the way that it ought to be done, uh, in terms of grants, in terms of social support, in terms of justice, uh, in, in, the, in terms of health care delivery. And it's not just the, the very poorest countries where this has actually failed to occur, but until very recently, America as well, until Obamacare came along, uh, their, their track record in terms of having a morally defendable um, approach to social justice was appalling. I have a question about the Caesar rape in, uh, in private. So not public, but private. Um, what if you have a perfect world, like no lack of resources of money or whatever? How can we change this this trend of more seizures? Because the patient requests a seizure, the private doctor doesn't have any problems because it's easy and they don't have to run the whole night for the patient. But it's very high rate. So, do you have any ideas how we? can change that back. Yes, instead of spending 0.4% of the, the curriculum time teaching bioethics, considerably more needs to be spent on it at an undergraduate and postgraduate level. Because the people who are doing that are not realizing their, their, their ethical responsibilities as a medical practitioner. As I already outlined to you, you do not need to become complicit in other people's poor moral judgment. So if somebody wants something because they want it, they're behaving like a two-year-old. And if, if what they want is actually going to be harmful to them, and potentially to other people, then you do not need to, you do, not need to do what they wish to, to have done. And the fact that you do what they wish to have done is more often than not, I would have thought, a question of dealing with the perverse incentives in the private sector. That you do it because you know that if you don't do it, they're going to go somewhere else, 
for not only for that cesarean section, but for future care, and you lose a patient. So there's a commercial incentive here, and this is medicine in the marketplace, and it's not where you want it to be. But it's also defensive medicine because MPS has pushed us towards that in the private sector. So it's not, it's not trying to make it more comfortable for us. But if you have a patient, yeah, if you if you have a patient in front of you who will not deliver vaginally, she if you make her deliver vaginally, something goes wrong or she's got a traumatic experience, she goes and sues you. So it's it's not the question. And and I come from a very good teaching school and I did not believe in cesarean sections on demand but work in private sector for one year, be sued once. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, look, I think you've come in late and, the, and this is about the second or third slide was to do with reduction in mortality rates and there's a point of inflection in that graph at 20% beyond which there is no evidence, no evidence at all that you're going to reduce the mortality rate any further. So the argument that you're putting forward, in fact, is specious. I understand that everybody fears being sued, and I understand that some people are going to get sued where, where there's no good cause to be sued. But, you know, that comes together with it, a whole procedural uh, aspect of justice whereby people that are accused of various things have the evidence in favor or against that particular misdemeanor, whatever it may be, tried in a court of law and adjudicated. And I would put it to you, because I do a lot of medical legal work, that, that people are being sued for good reason in this country and claims have been settled. The, the fact that everybody's paying so much for MPS subscriptions every year is because there is palpable negligence. I'm not talking about anything subtle now. Palpable negligence. So we need to clean up our act, and I think we must stop invoking this argument. It's not valid. Us. You don't need a microphone. Uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> the, the question I've got is that uh, I know we've got two-tier system, the public and the private health sector. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Professor Dion Duplessis was the dean of uh, Pretoria University at some stage. Gave a lecture here, and we were ranked 12 in medical health care in the private sector in terms of standard of care in the world. That's what was presented here. So I feel I would like to ask you a question. The people that ask a cesarean section on demand is the professional community of doctors themselves and the, uh, the legal uh, uh, group of people. So what is your your view on this. Why would we have these two communities have the most commonly or are the most common people to ask for cesarean section on demand? I, mean, I don't think who you are you know, qualifies the arguments at all. You know? it, it comes from the same place. It comes from a sense of anxiety maybe. It comes from a sense of convenience. Uh, who knows what motivates people to ask for things that they think are going to be beneficial to them in one way or another or desirable to them in one way or another. There's probably a multiplicity of different reasons, but I don't think the fact that it's lawyers or, or doctors, and is it actually truly lawyers and doctors that are, that are overrepresented in this group? I don't know that it is. How do you know that? Where, did, where does that information come from? But even if it is, so what? So may I just say that is there a place to think, how can we change things? Is, doesn't it go about philosophy? Because I noticed on your one slide that Namibia has scored better than South Africa. Yeah, but, but that's not statistically significant. It's all down at the bottom. No, the, all I'm saying is they, they scored better than us. And if you think where they're standing in medical care in terms of where we are coming from, I thought we were all, always probably to the advantage. No, I, I don't agree with you. Leon. And to come back to Kurbis for a moment, 
It's not all about philosophy, okay? I mean, the, the, you know, bioethics is something which, which people need to get their minds around. It's, it's, not a, it's not a transaction that arises because you become perplexed about making a decision somewhere along the line. Bioethics is inherent in every single interaction that you have with a patient ever, okay? And it's, it's something which is poorly taught, as it happens, better taught at Stellenbosch than in most other universities in this country. But it's still not enough. And the fact that we, we graduate doctors who leave here and then do the things which I've been talking of now uh, without thinking twice about it is a problem. It is a huge problem. section is better and that's why they actually that's why a number of people in private practice are actually choosing a cesarean section so I think it boils back down to educating the general population as well that when they come in and they actually request an elective cesarean section that your response to them and it has to be from a, a group of gynecologists and midwives is that this is not a realistic and not an appropriate debate between the two and that there is a certain number that needs to be done but that they should rather be attempting a vaginal delivery and I mean haven't been just been through the process and going through the process again if you look at the videos at the antenatal care um, workshops patients are really presented a choice they said you can have a vaginal delivery or you can have a cesarean section and here are the risks but it's not presented as we advise you to have a vaginal delivery and if there's a complication you can have a cesarean section so I think it's very easy to say it's a gynecologist's fault but it's not it's really how we're educating women in our country and if you look at the UK and you look at Australia their education system is very different and they don't come into private practice requesting a cesarean section <coughs> Granted, I mean, I think what you're saying is that there's a permissive environment here to begin with, that people know they can have what they want because the, the practitioners are doing that. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, is that they, they, they are allowed to make a decision on the basis of inadequate informed consent. Therein lies the rub. And who's responsible for that? We are. Uh, John, just another comment in support of your argument. Um, in the white paper on the national health insurance um, in par that was before Parliament, uh, which analyzed various aspects of healthcare in South Africa, but it clearly states there that the private sector in South Africa is the most expensive healthcare service on the globe. If you take what it costs and the number of people that are serviced, there are no other health services on the globe that's that expensive. It's even more expensive than the health service in the United States. Uh, grossly speaking, if, you, if we have to apply this to the entire population, 28% uh, of our GDP will go into health, which clearly is not, not viable. And I, I honestly think uh, there need to be a readjustment. Uh, it cannot be so expensive. Unless that readjustment comes, the amount of money available for private health care is going to, and the proportion of the population that can afford it is going to become less and less and less. So I think it's in the private health care system's own interest to, to, to curtail cost and to make it a more affordable service for more people. I agree with you. And unfortunately, the governance of the private sector has not to do so much with anything other than organizations like SASOG, um, which, are, which are, again, more to do with the, with the private sector than, than with the profession as a whole. Um, so the, the, reg the regulatory function within the society is um, vested in the hands of people who, who, who would really wish to see the, the, the current status quo continue. And, and the, only, the only possibility of overruling that would come from um, legislative change, and that is in any, in any event in prospect. So, you know, and I, and I would have to say that from a, from, a, from a moral point of view, it's very difficult to argue against that legislative change. It's, it's de desperately needed, and we cannot continue to be the way we are. 